Good afternoon, everyone. This is Erin Schneider at CityMatch, and we'll go ahead and get started with our CityMatch Learning Network webinar, um, Policies Targeting Alcohol and Drug Use During Pregnancy and Their Impacts. Today we're featuring Dr. Sarah Roberts from the University of California, San Francisco. So a few housekeeping tips for everybody as we get started. Um, for the duration of the call, everyone's going to be on mute. Um, if you need to unmute your line once we get to the Q&A portion, you can press star seven. And if you experience any sort of technical difficulties during the call, you're welcome to call the ReadyTalk customer line, or you can also send us a message in the chat box. And feel free as, as the presenter is presenting to um, send us questions in the chat box as well. So Dr. Sarah Roberts is an associate professor at ANSWER at the University of California, San Francisco. She studies the ways that policies and the healthcare system punish rather than support vulnerable pregnant women, including pregnant women using alcohol and drugs and pregnant women considering abortion. Dr. Roberts' current research focuses on evaluating state-level restrictive abortion policies and state-level policies targeting alcohol and drug use during pregnancy and developing an evidence base to inform a genuine public health approach to abortion. Dr. Roberts is also leading a project to engage public health professionals working in health departments in reflecting on abortion-related work in health departments and opportunities to align this work with accepted public health frameworks. Dr. Roberts has published more than 60 peer-reviewed manuscripts and, and has received grant funding from multiple private foundations, as well as the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Roberts' work has been published in JAMA, American Journal of Public Health, Maternal and Child Health Journal, and Alcohol and Alcoholism. Dr. Roberts received her undergraduate degree in history from Columbia University, her MPH and a graduate certificate in women's studies from the University of Michigan, and her doctorate in public health from the University of California, Berkeley. Prior to becoming an academic public health researcher, Dr. Roberts spent a decade working in local health departments. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Roberts. So, thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Erin, uh, for that introduction and for hosting me today. Um, I'm going to talk to you about research that um, I've been doing over the past decade related to um, alcohol and drug use during pregnancy and policies related to alcohol and drug use during pregnancy. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about a study that we call the Drug and Alcohol Pregnancy Policy Study, or DAPS for short and tell you about what we've learned, what we still need to learn, and make some suggestions for a path forward, both in terms of research and in terms of practice. I want to start with the take-home messages. Um, first, do not assume that existing policies targeting alcohol and drug use during pregnancy have the intended effects of reducing use during pregnancy or adverse birth outcomes. Second, and this is, um, if you take nothing else away from um, the presentation other than this bullet point, um, you will have gotten the main point. Um, harms from substance use during pregnancy come from substance use itself and from the policies implemented in response. Usually when we talk about substance use in pregnancy, we focus on the harms from the use itself. And what I want us to do is to begin to shift our focus to the harms that are caused by um, the policies and practices adopted in response. And then lastly, we need to envision new policies that support pregnant women who use alcohol and drugs and that effectively reduce harms from substance use during pregnancy. Um, as Erin uh, said, I am an associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. I study the way policies in the healthcare system punish rather than support vulnerable pregnant women. I've published um, uh, more than 60 peer-reviewed publications, including more than 20 related to alcohol and drug use during pregnancy. The research I'm going to tell you about now um, comes, uh, it has been funded primarily by NIH, including a recent NIH R01 grant about the impact of alcohol and pregnancy policies. But my inspiration for doing this work actually came from my decade working in local health departments including a local California health department working on perinatal substance use. So I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to go back to where I started on this topic and share the results um, of this work. So I'm going to give you some background, tell you about the DAP study, um, talk um, about the policies that we're looking at, the impact of the policies, 
briefly talk about drug use and pregnancy policies and then make some conclusions um, and offer some policy implications. And then given that some of our findings might seem a little counterintuitive, I'm going to offer um, my take on how we got here and make some suggestions for what we can do differently moving forward. So in terms of background, um, as I mentioned, I got my start um, on uh, doing work related to substance use during pregnancy um, more than a decade ago when I worked in a local California, health, local California County Health Department working as part of their um, perinatal substance abuse partnership. And I got started working on a project um, uh, related to barriers to prenatal care for pregnant women who use alcohol and drugs. Um, and the sort of goal of starting to work on this project was to develop a community-based um, uh, community awareness campaign related to prenatal care for pregnant women who use alcohol and drugs. And to do that, um, we started by doing interviews and focus groups. Um, and what we learned when we talked with women who used um, alcohol and drugs during their pregnancy, um, what we learned about barriers to prenatal care was that similar to other low-income women, they faced bureaucratic and logistical barriers to care. So challenges um, uh, with getting Medi-Cal funding or Medicaid funding for prenatal care, um, challenges with transportation, child care, um, challenges getting appointments later in their pregnancy. Some of those were exacerbated by their drug use, um, but for the most part, they were really similar to other low-income women. They also feared having already um, irreversibly harmed their baby, and I'll talk more about that. They believe that it's necessary to stop using drugs before going to prenatal care, and they were absolutely terrified of being reported to Child Protective Services, losing their children and going to jail. This is what fear of having already harmed their baby um, sounded like that guilt of knowing that you've used, because you know nine times out of 10, it will affect your baby in some way, form, or another. I was so worried because I had used in the first couple of months that there was going to be something wrong with my baby. Being able to go to prenatal care took a lot of that stress off me, because they're telling me my baby's okay, and I'm not this, and I'm not that. That relieved a lot of stress on my part, a lot of stress. The more clean I got, I was like out of there. I was like tripping, like hella tripping. I didn't know what was going on with my kid. The guilt was really bad. I was scared. I didn't want to know. I really didn't. I did not want to know if there was anything wrong. So one of the things that we did um, as part of the interviews and focus groups was we asked um, women to tell us what we should do for this community awareness campaign. We asked them to actually draw us pictures um, in addition to just verbally telling us. And this is a picture that one of the participants drew. Um, there is a pregnant woman smoking a pipe of something, um, and there's a baby speaking saying, mommy, don't lose, get help not to use. If you use, you both lose. Now what um, occurred to me when I saw this um, was that this was a message about telling women to stop their drug use. It wasn't a message about telling women to go to prenatal care, um, and that was what we had asked women um, to, to draw for us. And so I asked the participant um, that question. You know, we asked you to tell us what we could do to um, uh, tell women to go to prenatal care. And what you told us was to tell women to stop using drugs. Um, and this, is, uh, this was not the first time this had come up. Um, and this is what women had to say in response to that question. Essentially, you have to stop using before you go to the doctor. So you know what? A lot of women that are going through that don't go to the doctor because they're using, and that's the first step. You have to get some help. I mean, there's nothing else I can say. They're not going to the doctor if they're using because they don't want them to know that they're pregnant and using. I had to leave, actually, physically leave to go get clean because I couldn't have stayed here and gotten clean. It was not an option. I didn't consider prenatal care until I was home. I probably should have. I felt really guilty, but it was like, as long as I was getting clean in my head, that was like step one, stop there, stop using, stop doing bad. Then once you started getting clean, it was like guilt. That's what's really funny. I mean, as soon as I felt I was ready for prenatal care, I got it. So returning back to the last um, uh, piece that I mentioned, um, women were absolutely terrified of being reported to Child Protective Services and losing the baby. 
this fear um, came up um, in 18 out of the 20 individual interviews we did, as well as in each of the focus groups we did, even though there was no direct question asking about this um, in the interview. Um, because of this fear, women avoid prenatal care. Some get prenatal care despite the fear. And others go to prenatal care to build the track record to keep their baby or reunify with other children. As one said, if I don't go, it counts as abuse or neglect. What I want to make really clear um, is that women are not um, uh, sort of paranoid or fearful without reason. Um, women are reported to Child Protective Services related to maternal alcohol and drug use. Um, in a study that we did in the same county where we had done the research, about 1% of all newborns were reported to Child Protective Services related to maternal alcohol and drug use um, during pregnancy. Another more recent study um, that uh, has a much broader um, uh, look um, found a similar estimate. And what's notable, though, um, is that this is uh, dramatically different um, in different racial and ethnic groups. Um, so about um, so black newborns are about four times more likely to be reported than white newborns. So if you think about who might be fearful of being reported um, uh, based on what's actually happening, you would expect that fear to be much more common among black newborns than white newborns, or white uh, moms than, uh, uh, or black moms than white moms. So this small study um, motivated me to want to really understand whether or not these same patterns that we saw in one county in a small study um, existed when we looked at this um, in a broader way. So that motivated um, the Drug and Alcohol Pregnancy Policy Study, which is a study of 40 years of state policies related to alcohol and drug use during pregnancy and their impact. Um, even though it's just me presenting here today, um, this work is, uh, was a collaboration between multiple different institutions. So my um, research group, ANSWER, at the University of California, San Francisco, the Alcohol Research Group, the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation, and San Jose State University, um, as well as multiple uh, researchers um, and uh, uh, other people who've assisted us in the work. So I want to just briefly um, start. We're going to shift a little bit from a focus on drug use during pregnancy to alcohol use during pregnancy. Um, and I want to be really, uh, I want to state this incredibly clearly, um, because even though the take-home message has to do with the harms um, from the policies related to use during pregnancy, um, I want to make it really clear that this is not to ignore at all the harms um, related to especially alcohol use during pregnancy. Um, but uh, so I want to sort of make sure to say this explicitly. Alcohol is a known teratogen that causes fetal alcohol syndrome and a range of other harms to fetuses. Use during pregnancy is common. It's about 15% of pregnant women in the U.S. reporting any alcohol use, and almost 3% reporting binge drinking in the past month. Um, and I will say that these um, estimates of how common it is to use during pregnancy have remained pretty steady since the beginning of the 1990s. So the policies that I'm going to talk about today fall into these categories. They include um, mandatory warning signs. So the laws that require um, uh, signs um, uh, warning about potential of birth defects from drinking during pregnancy to be um, posted in places where alcohol um, is sold. Um, different priority treatment policies, um, essentially allowing pregnant women to go to the front of the line for substance abuse treatment. Um, prohibitions against criminal prosecution that have to do with the uh, use of m uh, medical test results um, in criminal prosecutions related to substance use during pregnancy. Reporting requirements for data and treatment purposes. Um, reporting requirements for Child Protective Services purposes. Laws that define use during pregnancy as child abuse and neglect. Um, and then civil commitment um, policies that allow people to be involuntarily um, put in treatment or in jail related to their use during pregnancy. In a lot of the literature, as well as um, in discussions more broadly, um, certainly I had when I worked um, in local health departments, a lot of times when we think about these policies, we think of supportive um, versus punitive approaches. So um, at a very basic level, we can think of supportive policies as those that seek to provide information, early intervention, and treatment of services to pregnant women. 
and punitive policies as those that seek to control pregnant women's behavior by civilly committing them, mandating reporting to law enforcement and or child welfare agencies, and initiating child welfare proceedings or using the threat of such actions to compel behavior change. Um, when we uh, try and classify um, the policies um, that we're looking at, um, those that are in blue are those that are typically classified as supportive, and those that are in yellow are those that are typically classified as punitive. Um, and uh, I know from experience um, uh, having this conversation um, with people that there's some disagreement um, about these categories. Um, and uh, I, I certainly welcome that as a conversation if that's um, what people would like to discuss during the question and answer period. Um, but uh, what I hope the bigger take um, home uh, is, is that I'm not actually sure that's the most useful way for us to be categorizing um, these policies anyway, and that I really think we should be focusing more on effectiveness rather than on their um, more sort of political interpretation. To give you a sense of how common these policies are today, um, this is uh, from 2016, um, data from 2016 that um, has remained relatively stable um, since then. Um, mandatory warning signs, um, reporting requirements for data and treatment purposes, as well as reporting requirements for child protective services purposes, and laws that define use during pregnancy as child abuse and neglect um, are the more common policies. Less common are the priority treatment policies, the prohibitions against criminal prosecution, and civil commitment. This slide um, shows changes in these policies over time. Um, uh, on the y-axis um, is the number of states that have that policy in effect, um, and on the x-axis is the year. You can see that the first policies were enacted in 1974. Um, uh, the first one was a child abuse and neglect policy in Massachusetts in 1974. Um, and then you can see that all of the different um, policies have increased over time, um, including both that are more those that are more punitive and those that are more um, supportive. The other way um, to look at this is to think about what the entire policy environment is in a given state. Um, so what you can see here is whether um, there's no policies, the number of states that have no policies, the number of states that have only punitive policies, number of states that only have supportive policies, and number of states that have mixed um, both supportive and punitive policies. Um, early on, when a state had a policy, they were um, all punitive. Soon after that, they were either punitive or supportive. And over time, they've become more mixed. Um, the way they become more mixed, though, is typically states that have supportive policies add punitive policies on top of it. So overall, the policy environments have become more punitive over time. In terms of our primary research questions, we had three. The first was, do alcohol and pregnancy policies lead to reductions in alcohol use during pregnancy? The second was, do alcohol and pregnancy policies improve birth outcomes, particularly low birth weight and preterm birth? And do alcohol and pregnancy policies lead to increases in health care use, um, particularly prenatal care use? To answer these questions, we engaged in a legal epidemiology study. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with this term, um, it's a term that was, uh, I think, just coined in the published literature, I think, in 2016 or so. And um, it includes a few different components. Um, but really, the overall goal is to look at laws as the cause of health and ill health. Um, uh, as opposed to looking at behaviors or medications um, as causes of health and ill health. What we did um, as part of the study was we conducted um, uh, more than 40 years of alcohol pregnancy policy, um, policy surveillance, um, where we coded policies um, using rigorous uh, methods um, uh, used for social science research purposes. We then used more than 30 years um, of data from um, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, um, and these data were related to alcohol use during pregnancy, and then more than 40 years of birth outcomes and prenatal care data from vital statistics records. 
For a few more details, um, for BRFIS data, we, um, our sample included about 57,000 pregnant women between 1985 and 2016. We looked at three outcomes, um, all pertaining to use in the past month, any alcohol use, any binge drinking, and then heavy drinking, which we defined as 16 or more drinks um, over the past month, which isn't considered heavy drinking outside of pregnancy, um, but it corresponds to about four drinks a week, um, which is the threshold at which um, studies very consistently show harm. We linked the data um, to policy data on state and year and used multivariable logistic regression. With fixed effects for state and year, we waited to account for the complex sample and we clustered, the standard, we clustered the standard errors by state. We included a number of individual um, and state level covariates. And then to be able to interpret the findings and understand the magnitude of effects, we used the post estimation margins command to obtain predicted probabilities. For the birth certificate data, um, uh, we used about 150 million singleton births. Um, depending on which analysis um, I'm presenting, um, some of them ended in 2013, some added two more years of data. Um, and just to make this explicit for everybody on the call, um, the sample uh, uh, for everybody born between 1972 to 1980, um, about 50% of all births um, in the US were included. And then after that, it's a 100% sample of all births. So depending on when you were born, you either have a 50% chance, um, and if you were born in the US, you either have a 50% chance um, of being in the sample, um, or you are for sure in the sample. Um, the outcomes we looked at included low birth weight, preterm birth, APGAR score, and prenatal care. Um, and we linked the policy data um, uh, to the vital statistics data on the state um, and month and year of conception. So um, this uh, month and year she became pregnant. Um, we used the same analysis methods as in the BRFIS data, but because we had a much larger sample, we were also able to include state-specific time trends, which helps us um, uh, feel more confident um, that our results are causal. So briefly, um, uh, I want to summarize our findings for alcohol use during pregnancy, um, and I'll summarize the rest of the findings, and I'll show you um, some regression output just to give you a flavor of what it looks like, um, and then some graphs um, to help um, show uh, what the findings look like. So we found that most alcohol and pregnancy policies were not associated with alcohol use during pregnancy, and those that were had effects in different directions. Priority treatment was associated with more self-reported drinking, and mandatory warning signs and child abuse and neglect were associated with less self-reported drinking. Um, and what you can see on the slide is that I actually really emphasize the self-reported drinking um, uh, component, because this is self-report data. And given our findings on the birth outcomes, um, uh, this really suggests to me that what we're seeing here has to do with people's willingness um, to report and disclose their use in different policy environments. For those of you who are interested in more of the methodological components, um, uh, this does not show the entire regression model. It doesn't show the um, components uh, uh, for the um, uh, individual or state level control variables. Um, but what it does show you is what um, the models look like and what the output from the model looks like um, for uh, uh, the, the models that include all of the policies at the same time. So you can see um, increased odds of any drinking um, for priority treatment for uh, both pregnant women and women with children, um, and then uh, decreased odds of reporting binge or heavy drinking with mandatory warning signs um, and child abuse and neglect. Um, and the mandatory warning signs uh, decreased odds is only for um, binge drinking. Um, in order to sort of help understand what this means, um, this is a graph of the predicted probabilities um, that we obtained um, from the, the models from post-estimation commands. Um, and what you can see here, again, is that with mandatory warning signs, um, mandatory warning signs were associated with decrease of about 1.2% in um, binge drinking, um, similar for child abuse and neglect. Um, for binge drinking and child abuse and neglect for heavy drinking. 
birth parity treatment for pregnant women and women with children was associated with um, a little about two and a half percent increase in the predicted probability of reporting any drinking. In terms of findings for birth outcomes, um, these findings are much more consistent. Um, we found that half of the alcohol and pregnancy policies led to increases in low birth weight and preterm birth. Low birth weight and preterm birth were higher when any of the following were in effect. Mandatory warning signs, party treatment for pregnant women, prohibitions on criminal prosecution, and child abuse and neglect. Um, uh, instead of showing you the model output, um, since with 40 years of data and 150 million um, observations, knowing the implications of a significant odds ratio, it, it, that's difficult to interpret. Um, the more saturated colors here are when um, the associations were statistically significant, um, and the blanks here are when the models would not converge. Um, uh, so for mandatory warning signs, there was about a, um, a 0.3% um, increase in low birth weight when mandatory warning signs was in effect. Similar um, magnitude of increase for priority treatment um, and prohibitions on criminal prosecution as well as child abuse and neglect. For preterm birth, um, uh, we see, again, a relatively similar magnitude um, of an increase in preterm birth um, associated with mandatory warning signs of about 0.3%, um, about 0.7% for priority treatment um, uh, for pregnant women only, 0.4% for priority treatment for pregnant women and women with children, and close to 1% for prohibitions on criminal prosecution. And for child abuse and neglect, about 0.7%. In terms of findings for prenatal care, three of the alcohol and pregnancy policies led to decreased prenatal care use, and one alcohol and pregnancy policy led to increased prenatal care use. And this was across one or more um, uh, measures. Um, mandatory warning signs, child abuse and neglect, and civil commitment led to less prenatal care use, and priority treatment for pregnant women led to more prenatal care use. The most consistent finding, though, was for mandatory warning signs. So to summarize um, the answers to our primary research questions, do alcohol and pregnancy policies lead to reductions in alcohol, and use, to alcohol use during pregnancy? Maybe slightly. Do alcohol and pregnancy policies improve birth outcomes, particularly low birth weight and preterm birth? No, they actually increase adverse birth outcomes. And then, do alcohol and pregnancy policies lead to increases in healthcare utilization? No, they actually decrease prenatal care use. So um, to give you one more illustration um, of why these findings are important, um, we did another um, study where we actually tried to estimate the numbers of babies born low birth weight or preterm due to these policies um, being in effect. Um, uh, so we took uh, the findings that we had done, we extended them an additional two years, and then we applied um, those estimates to births um, in the U.S. Um, in 2015. We found was that in 2015, um, there were about an additional 7,000 babies born either low birth weight or preterm due to mandatory warning signs, between 7 and 10,000 due to priority treatment for pregnant w women, um, between 2 and 4,000 due to prohibitions on criminal prosecution, and between 6 and 12,000 due to child abuse and neglect policy. And these um, additional, um, these babies um, born low birth weight and preterm due to these policies um, lead to health care costs of between $42 million and $583 million in the first year. So you, um, like us, um, as well as other people that um, I've spoken with about this study, may be asking yourself, why? Um, why, you know, how is this possible? Um, and so I want to tell you about some possible mechanisms. Um, the top two, I would say, are consistent with research evidence from other studies. And then I want to offer you some explanations um, that make sense from a logic perspective um, for the other two. So I think first, mandatory warning signs connecting back um, to the qualitative research that we did, um, as well as other research that's been published, 
could contribute to fear of already having harmed um, one's baby by use earlier in pregnancy, and thus not changing substance use after discovering pregnancy, um, and also avoiding care. It's also possible that mandatory warning signs contribute to increased stigma um, around use um, during pregnancy, and that then um, uh, leads to other um, disengagement with care. Child abuse and neglect um, could contribute to fear of having a child removed by child um, protective services, and thus to people avoiding um, both prenatal care and treatment. Um, things that are um, a bit more speculative, um, but make sense from a logical perspective, um, it's possible that priority treatment policies are a proxy for not having enough treatment slots in a state. So a state that doesn't have enough treatment may um, enact a policy to get, let pregnant women go to the front of the line, um, whereas states that have enough treatment slots overall wouldn't need that policy. Um, it's also possible um, that priority treatment that allows pregnant women to go to the front of the line could make it so people in general um, have a harder time getting treatment before pregnancy, um, or people's partners um, or other family members can't get treatment. And then prohibitions on criminal prosecution might exist in states that have prosecuted more. Um, and so it may, um, that may be a, a proxy um, for being in a state where there have been more prosecutions. And I would say more research is needed to really understand these mechanisms in more depth. So we had some secondary research questions that I want to walk us through. Um, the first was, do relationships between alcohol and pregnancy policies and alcohol use during pregnancy, birth outcomes, and healthcare utilizations vary by race and ethnicity? And second, by socioeconomic status. Our general hypothesis was that white women and higher SES women will experience more benefits from policies, and black women and lower SES women will experience more harms from policies. To answer this question, um, we used the same data sets that we used before, um, but we added um, race by policy or SES by policy interaction terms. We used the same general analysis approach as for the main effects model. We included one interaction term in each model, but all policies were included as controls. Whether the policy was significant for white women or women with high school education um, is based on the p-value for the main effect of that policy from the regression model. Whether the effects vary by race was determined by the wall test for the interaction um, as, a, uh, as a whole, plus the race by the policy or SES by policy terms in the model. And then we use the post-estimation margins commands to get the predicted values and guide interpretation. In terms of the alcohol use outcomes, um, uh, the impact of alcohol and pregnancy policies on alcohol use varied by race in some cases but not across the board. Consistent with our hypotheses, white women benefited from some supportive policies, and black women benefited less than white women. But the impacts of priority treatment went in a variety of different directions and were complicated. Punitive policies were not associated with reduced drinking among white women, and black women may have been less likely to report drinking um, when child abuse and neglect was in place. Again, um, the birth outcomes um, uh, findings were more consistent and I would say more robust um, than the alcohol use findings. Um, and uh, I will say that there's likely two reasons. Um, one having to do with the much larger sample size um, uh, and then uh, um, the other has to do with measurement um, of the outcomes. In terms of what we found for birth outcomes, the impact of alcohol and pregnancy policies varied by race for preterm birth, varied in a few cases for low birth weight, and generally did not vary for prenatal care. The hypothesis regarding the direction of differential effects was not supported, though. Six policies had an adverse impact on low birth weight or preterm birth for white women. The findings differed for black women. For black women, one policy had an adverse um, impact for low birth weight, and four policies had a beneficial impact for preterm birth.
In terms of supportive policies um, and low birth weight, um, this is what we found. Um, again, you can see an increase um, for white women. Um, the more saturated uh, uh, parts on the graph, saturated and color parts of the graph are those that were st statistically significant. For black women, um, we didn't see um, uh, as many effects. Um, and the one that was significant was in the same direction as for white women. Um, in terms of punitive policies, um, we saw uh, an increase um, in low birth weight for white women when child abuse and neglect um, was in effect, but we didn't see any effects um, for the other punitive policies for white women, um, nor did we see any of the um, effects among black women. In terms of preterm birth, um, the patterns were a little bit different, um, uh, and they were more consistent. So across the board, um, all of the supportive policies um, were associated with increases in preterm birth for white women. Um, and then the two that were statistically significant were associated with decreases in preterm birth for black women. Um, in terms of punitive policies, um, uh, we saw an increase in preterm birth um, due to child abuse and neglect for white women. We did not see that same effect for black women. Um, we did not see effects of the two other punitive policies for white women, but we did see decreases um, in preterm birth um, uh, related to child abuse, uh, related to civil commitment and child protective services reporting policies um, uh, for black women. In terms of the SES differences in policy impacts, the impacts of alcohol and pregnancy policies varied by education status for preterm birth for all policies and for prenatal care for some policies. The hypothesis regarding the direction of differential effects was not supported, though. So similar, um, uh, just overall, similar to the uh, race um, based, the findings for by race, um, uh, the more advantaged group seemed to have more adverse con uh, effects and the less advantaged group um, had either no effects um, or some beneficial effects. So five policies had an adverse impact on low birth weight or preterm birth for high school grads. Six policies had an adverse impact on low birth weight or preterm birth for, for women with more than high school education. The findings differed for women with less than high school education. For women with less than high school, two policies had beneficial effects on low birth weight or preterm birth. For prenatal care, the Patterns were generally similar, with adverse effects concentrated among women with more education and beneficial effects among women with less education. So in terms of just the summary um, to answer this question, relationships between alcohol pregnancy policies and alcohol use during pregnancy, birth outcomes, and healthcare use do vary by both race and ethnicity and socioeconomic status. The hypothesis was not supported, though. With exceptions, the harms were concentrated among white women and higher SES women. And to the extent there were benefits, the benefits were concentrated among black women and lower SES women. So in conclusion, at best, most alcohol and pregnancy policies do not affect use during pregnancy, birth outcomes, or prenatal care. And at worst, some alcohol and pregnancy policies led to increases in low birth weight and preterm birth and to decreases in prenatal care use. The effects of policies vary by race and ethnicity and FES. So what I would say um, very clearly is that harms from alcohol use during pregnancy come from alcohol use itself and from the policies implemented in response. What about policies related to drug use during pregnancy? Um, when I first started working on this topic, um, uh, there was a very strong refrain that we um, punish um, drug use during pregnancy more than we pu punish alcohol use during pregnancy. Um, and there are certainly elements of that stated very clearly in published literature. So um, uh, we had intended to control for policies related to drug use during pregnancy in our analyses. Um, and we therefore then looked at policies related to drug use during pregnancy over the same time period that we looked at policies related to alcohol use during pregnancy. What we found though, um, and I'll show you this um, on a graph, um, is that for the most part, the policies actually, um, when they are in effect, overlap. The only exception is mandatory warning signs. 
So what this graph shows you um, is that when there was a policy related to either alcohol or drug use during pregnancy in a state, um, for the most part, those that are in yellow, um, they covered both alcohol and drugs. The blue is covering alcohol but not drugs, and the green, drugs but not alcohol. And what you can see is that pretty much across the board, when there was a policy related to either alcohol or drugs during pregnancy in effect in the state, it covered both alcohol and drugs. The main exception was mandatory warning signs that until recently um, only applied to alcohol. Um, with uh, the rise of cannabis legalization in states, some states have begun um, adopting uh, mandatory warning signs policies related to cannabis use during pregnancy. So with the exception of mandatory warning signs, most alcohol and pregnancy policies also address drug use. States that legalize cannabis are starting to adopt mandatory warning signs for cannabis use. Um, so what we can say from this, and we did the analyses um, to indicate that this is the case, for the most part, the findings related to alcohol use during pregnancy policies also apply to policies related to drug use during pregnancy. Um, so it's better to think of them as the impacts of policies related to alcohol and or drug use during pregnancy. So harms from substance use during pregnancy come from use itself and from the policies implemented in response. And I think that we can say that both related to alcohol-related um, policies and drug-related policies. So I want to summarize what we learned. At best, most alcohol and pregnancy policies and drug and pregnancy policies do not affect use during pregnancy, birth outcomes, or prenatal care use. At worst, some alcohol and pregnancy policies and drug and pregnancy policies lead to increases in low birth weight and preterm birth and to decreases in prenatal care use. The effects of policies appear to vary by race, ethnicity, and by SES. What we still need to learn. <coughs> I think um, one thing we need to learn um, is whether there are any impacts of alcohol and pregnancy policies and drug pregnancy policies on other health-related outcomes such as heavier use during pregnancy, including use that um, raise, uh, rises to a level of being an alcohol use disorder. Substance use disorders during pregnancy, including both alcohol and drug use disorders. Child maltreatment, and then um, fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. I also think we need more research to understand the mechanisms that contribute to the differential effects by race ethnicity and SES of alcohol pregnancy and drug pregnancy policies. And we need to do more research to figure out whether the findings are due to the policy focus on alcohol or on drugs. So um, even though I think there's more research that needs to be done, um, I think there are some short-term implications for policy and policy advocacy as well as practice. First, the findings related to race ethnicity differences and SES differences are not definitive enough to inform policy action. Policymakers should be cautious about adopting existing alcohol pregnancy or drug pregnancy policies in new states and expanding existing alcohol pregnancy or drug pregnancy policies to include new substances. I think that resources are needed to develop new policy approaches to alcohol and drug use during pregnancy that may be more likely to reduce health harms. Um, and to break, come back to a point I made earlier, I think that our focus on um, whether a policy is punitive or supportive is only one component of the conversation that we need to be having. I think we really need to shift our focus to thinking about how do we support pregnant women who use alcohol and drugs and how do we reduce the health-related harms from use during pregnancy. So I want to um, uh, take a moment and offer a few reflections um, on how we got here. Um, I will say when I first, um, uh, when we first started seeing the findings, I was rather surprised um, uh, by the patterns that we were seeing. Um, and it led me to do a bunch more reading and a bunch more reflection to understand how we got here. What I want to suggest um, is that we have not developed policies related to alcohol use during pregnancy and drug use during pregnancy through um, solid public health approaches. Rather, we've ended up where we are based on abortion politics and based on the war on drugs and the crack baby epidemic. 
and I will talk um, uh, you through how that works um, briefly. I think um, the first thing to know is that a number of legal scholars and sociologists for a long time have said that policymaking related to substance use during pregnancy um, and um, policies related to reproductive rights or abortion um, are linked. And so we took a quick look um, at this using our data um, on the policies that were in effect in uh, 2013. And we said, do states that have more punitive alcohol and pregnancy policies or more supportive alcohol and pregnancy policies? What's the correlation between having more of those policies and having um, policies that are effective at reducing alcohol use in general, things like taxation? Um, or restrictions on where alcohol can be bought um, and sold? Um, or are they more similar or highly correlated to, with states um, that have more uh, restrictions on reproductive rights? What we found was that having um, more supportive alcohol um, pregnancy policies was not linked to either having more effective alcohol um, policies in general um, or more, reproductive, more restrictive reproductive rights policies. We also found that having um, more punitive alcohol and pregnancy policies was not associated with having um, more uh, effective general um, population alcohol policies, but it was associated with having more restrictions on reproductive rights. Um, so that's a way of saying um, uh, that there does seem to be a link between policies restricting reproductive rights and policies that punish um, women for drinking during pregnancy and that they both have something to do with restricting um, autonomy of pregnant women. Um, to make this a little bit more concrete, I want to go through a little bit of history. Um, so in the uh, first um, study in the US um, that was published about fetal alcohol syndrome um, uh, during this era of attention to fetal alcohol syndrome, so in 1975, the authors um, recommended abortion as the solution. Um, so the authors concluded, the frequency of adverse outcome of pregnancy for chronic alcoholic women suggests that serious consideration be given to early termination of pregnancy in severely chronic alcoholic women. Um, this recommendation um, for abortion um, was present in the early literature um, through the 1970s, but it disappeared in the 1980s. Um, that came with a shift um, to recommendations of complete abstinence from alcohol, as opposed to early recommendations of don't drink more than six drinks at a time. Um, and then uh, we started to see elements of what I call um, abortion aversion. Um, so an argument that abstinence recommendations lead women using low levels of alcohol use um, to terminate otherwise wanted pregnancies. Um, and this uh, shows up um, very consistently in the literature, including in um, ACOG statements related to alcohol use during pregnancy. And also a concern that punitive policies regarding drug use during pregnancy lead to abortion. And in fact, there was a whole movie um, made about that, Citizen Ruth. So how does this connect back um, to the, the topic that we're here to talk about today? Um, in 2013, I published a paper um, where we looked at a sample of about 1,000 women seeking abortion and whether or not they reported alcohol or drug use as a reason for seeking abortion, and then if so, whether those pregnancies were um, intended or unintended. What we found was that about 2.5% reported alcohol use as a reason for abortion and 2.5% reported drug use as a reason for abortion, um, but pretty much um, all of them, um, uh, all of the pregnancies were unintended. Um, and on top of that, people were using more than low levels um, of alcohol use during pregnancy. So we published that paper. The journal published a commentary along with it. And the commentary basically said, now that we know um, that uh, recommending abstinence from alcohol use during pregnancy doesn't lead women to have abortions, we can now um, go ahead um, and recommend complete abstinence. And so that was of concern to me um, because basically there hadn't been any research um, to show that recommending complete abstinence from alcohol use during pregnancy led to more reductions in drinking than telling um, people to reduce their drinking or to not drink more than low levels. Um, and so if you're really interested in reducing harms from alcohol use during pregnancy, 
the research question um, that you would want to know the answer to is not whether a different recommendation leads to abortion, but whether or not um, a different recommendation actually leads to reductions in drinking or reductions um, in harms associated with drinking. Um, and so what I want to suggest is that there was more focus on the anxiety around abortion um, and considerations of messages around alcohol use during pregnancy than whether the messages actually have the intended outcome. The other component is when we think about um, uh, where these policies came from. Um, many of these policies, the types of policies we see, first showed up during um, the late 1980s and the early 1990s during the war on drugs um, and uh, the crack baby epidemic. Um, and what we see um, uh, is the emergence of punitive policies related to criminal prosecution, civil commitment, um, and then we see an argument that these punitive policies are not appropriate because there's not adequate treatment for pregnant women. Um, and uh, I certainly um, agree with that. I think that's an important point. The policy solution, though, um, ended up coming from an advocacy place um, and basically saying, um, well, what we need to do is have priority treatment for pregnant women, right? That's the solution to the problem. But it doesn't then look at whether priority treatment actually solves the problem. So does it solve underlying problems related to lack of treatment slots? Or what about use um, prior to pregnancy or somebody's partner? And then I would also say that just being in reaction to these punitive policies really means that the policy ideas that people are coming up with are reactions to punitive policies rather than thinking about what are the policies that would genuinely support pregnant women um, and really reduce um, uh, harms related to use during pregnancy. So what I think um, uh, is that if we stick with what we've done so far, we will continue to get the same old results. And I want to invite you um, uh, to thinking about how do we develop a path forward. Um, alcohol, drug, and pregnancy policies have not been developed through methods used to develop effective public health policies. Um, we need to start new conversations about policy strategies that are just and that may effectively reduce harms from alcohol and drug use during pregnancy. And we really need to think together about what policies that support pregnant women who use alcohol and drugs and that effectively reduce harms look like. I want to um, uh, offer a few acknowledgments, um, including women who share their thoughts, experiences, and suggestions. I want to thank our funders, March of Dimes, um, NIAAA, Contra Costa First Five, the University of California, um, San Francisco, um, uh, Sen Academic Senate Committee on Research, um, again, NIAAA, the UCSF California Preterm Birth Initiative, um, uh, the Wallace Alexander Gerbodi Foundation, Packard Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, and an Anonymous Foundation. And then I want to make it really explicit um, here, given um, that uh, the work does not re represent the official views of any of the funders, but make it very explicit um, that this uh, is uh, my responsibility um, and my views and does not necessarily represent the official views of NIH. Um, and here are uh, the references, and I am happy to send anybody copies of them um, if they would like them. And so with that, um, I would be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, if you have any questions, you can unmute your line by pressing star seven. In the meantime, um, we actually had one or a couple questions in the chat box. Um, the first one is, is the birth outcome data for the whole population? If so, how do you account for confounding due to other factors changing over time, since only a minority of pregnant women drink or use substances and thus would expect to be affected by the alcohol or drug policies that you studied? Um, it's, uh, well, the first answer is yes, the birth outcome data is for the whole population. Um, and then in terms of how we uh, deal with, um, uh, well, actually let me uh, say one piece in terms of um, the proportion who do use during pregnancy and then I'll answer the confounding question. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of uh, accounting, um, uh, so in terms of rates of use during pregnancy, um, 
any alcohol use is about 15% um, of pregnant women um, have used in the past month, um, but that's more probably if you look at any moment during pregnancy. Um, and then drug use during pregnancy, I mean, depending on the sample and when, I mean, we're still talking, you know, 5% in some populations and then more than 10% in other populations. So it's not incredibly rare um, outcomes. Um, uh, and then in terms of confounding, I mean, we control for um, a whole range of factors. We control for individual level factors um, present for each um, person in the data set. Um, uh, we also control for state um, specific characteristics for that particular state um, and year, so unemployment or poverty for that spe state, um, specific state or year, the level of overall alcohol consumption in that um, state um, uh, for that particular year. Um, and then we also include fixed effects for state and fixed effects for year, as well as um, state-specific time trends. Um, so uh, we um, include a component um, in the model um, f that's essentially an interaction term between state um, and time. And in fact, the time is actually cubic time um, to allow for uh, the varying trends um, in the states. Um, but I think the question um, of how do we get closer to the population um, I think is a great question. Um, and I would love any ideas that people have about how to, how to do that. Thanks. Um, we have a couple more questions. Uh, the first one is, are there populations that show low alcohol use during pregnancy? Um, let's see. I would say, can, I'm not sure I'm going to fully be able to do this off the top of my head, um, but I would say the groups that show more, the groups that tend to sort of drink more at all during pregnancy um, tend to be higher SES women, um, um, white women um, tend to drink more at all during pregnancy, um, uh, whereas, um, uh, at least historically, um, black women and lower SES women do tend to drink less. Um, I believe um, that is what at least the most recent data also show. Okay. Um, another question is, was there any difference in analysis regarding the birth outcomes and race slash SES? We didn't do a difference in difference analysis. Um, we considered that. I mean, um, uh, so there's different approaches to analyzing um, data over time. Um, one approach is to aggregate up um, uh, at the population uh, level um, and then do a difference in difference analysis. Um, we didn't do that. We chose to look um, at the individual data partly to correspond to what we did um, with the BRFIS data. Um, uh, and we couldn't do a difference in difference analysis aggregated up um, uh, for the BRFIS data because it's survey data and um, it's not uh, sort of considered you know, valid enough that there's too much error in it to be able to do a difference in difference analysis. And we wanted to keep our analysis um, methods the same. Okay. Um, we have a couple people with their hand raised. If you would like to speak, you can press star seven to unmute your line, or you can um, send me a message in the chat box. Uh, while you're all thinking of questions, um, I just wanted to chime in and say that we will be sending out an email uh, after the webinar that has a link to our evaluation and also some links um, from Dr. Roberts' organization with some various um, resources on them related to the presentation. And we're also going to be posting this on our City Match YouTube channel. So you can um, forward that along to your colleagues if they missed it. Um, do we have any other questions or comments, you can press star seven to unmute your line.
Okay. Hearing none. Oh, somebody came in right at the last second. <laughs> uh, oh, here's a couple more. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, one of the questions is, did the significant results differ depending on the state that enforced the supportive or punitive policies? Um, we didn't look at that. Um, this is really aggregated across um, all states. Um, and uh, I mean, I would also sort of say this, and actually this helps, this also gets back, gets at the previous question a little bit. From a percentage standpoint, the effects are really small. Um, uh, you know, this, to be able to detect a change of 0.3% being statistically significant um, in something, um, uh, you know, you, you really need a huge sample um, aggregated over um, a whole bunch of states. But when you actually apply that percentage to a whole population level, um, as you can see, you know, from the thousands um, of babies affected, I mean, it is a notable number. Um, and what I would actually say about the difference in differences approach is that I think that it may have less statistical power and you may be less likely to detect an effect. Um, and then, um, and actually, I'm going backwards in time um, again because I realized I had one other thing to say about the difference and differences part. We did attempt to try and do that, but thinking through how you navigate different policies that you want to control for different policies um, that went into effect at different times in different states, um, I'm not totally sure how you do that in a difference and differences framework um, since it's those are often used to look at one policy at a time. So if, you, if anybody knows how to do that, I would be thrilled to have that conversation, but it was really boggling our minds um, to try and think through how to do that. Um, so uh, I think I answered that question. Should I move on to the next one? Or um, Aaron, maybe it makes sense for you to read it out loud so everyone can hear. Yeah, sure. Um, what do you think can we do with policies to decrease alcohol and substance use during pregnancy? Can we only expect incremental changes? Let me actually um, uh, answer the second part first, which is I think one of the things that's really important to note is that I don't think, I mean, and it's not just that I don't think, but based on um, uh, even CDC publications of BRFAS data about alcohol use during pregnancy over time, there have been no notable changes in use during pregnancy since the beginning of the 1990s. So I don't think that we are ma even making any incremental changes. And so the fact that that's what, ex right, I mean, the, fa the fact that th those are the data that exist um, uh, in terms of national data over time, and the fact that our research doesn't really show that these policies are making much of a difference, I, I I think that if we even want to see incremental changes, um, I think we need to really take a step back and start again. And I, I don't know what the answer is on what the policy should be, um, but I do think that this is what public health knows how to do and public health practitioners know how to do. Uh, start with the people who use during pregnancy and the people who care for them to find out what are the policies um, uh, that you know, what are the barriers they're facing now? What are the challenges they're facing now? What are the policies and health messages that might actually make a difference? And really take a step back and do that really um, important uh, on the ground, collaborative, community engaged work um, to start again um, would really be what I would recommend in terms of figuring out how to move forward. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what do you think of drug testing all pregnant women when they come to the hospital to deliver? Um, that's a, that's a, it's a long answer um, that I can give. Um, I would say there's been a long push to make testing um, all women at delivery um, universal. And there's a number of different arguments that are made about why that's important. Um, one of the arguments um, that people make, um, uh, and this is where I get, um, this is where I'm an academic um, in terms of the sort of making this of a more complicated question. Um, but one of the arguments that's made is because there's a racial disparity um, in terms of who gets tested. 
Um, and so the only way to reduce that disparity would be to <coughs> um, uh, make testing universal. Um, and so I think there's a few things that need to be unpacked um, in relation to that argument that I think really help us get at the core of what this conversation is actually about. Um, uh, typically, um, uh, the sort of concern about testing at delivery is that it, right, there's two reasons you might want to test more people. One, you think some people are being missed and therefore that could be harmful. And then you think that maybe there are some people who are being um, uh, punished by being reported to Child Protective Services um, uh, and that that's sort of unjust um, in some way. And uh, what I would say is the argument about reducing the disparities um, would basically, you know, is coming from a framework of it is um, typically black women um, who are reported to Child Protective Services more and that that is of concern. So the argument is we should expand this more punitive um, policy or approach um, to white women. Typically when we think about reducing racial disparities, um, uh, what we're not, we, we're not usually sort of trying to expand something that we think of as bad to more people. We're trying to think of how do we reduce the thing um, that's, that, that's bad for the population that's experiencing it more. And so the way I try and think about it, um, and I think that what this brings up is a question of why are we testing people and how would this, um, how would what happened after testing, if that was different, how would that affect our views on disparities? And so. Um, from my perspective, the way I like to think about this is if right now testing at delivery typically leads people to be reported to Child Protective Services, and that happens more often for black women and newborns, and that that is, um, I'm going to say my view very clearly, that is unjust, and that disparity needs to be reduced. If instead of being reported to Child Protective Services based on a positive UTOX, somebody with a positive UTOX at delivery got six months of a night nurse and free childcare for a year, I wouldn't be concerned at all about the racial disparity as it exists now. Um, and so what that says to me, what I hope it says to other people is that the issue in terms of what we're doing about testing at delivery isn't so much about the testing, it's how we're responding. So I would encourage rather than thinking about how do we, whether we should or shouldn't make testing something universal, um, what is it we want that response to be and how do we build that response? And once we have that response up and running, then it's a question of should we expand that to more people? But I would not suggest that feeding more people into a system that we have concerns about um, through testing more people um, is the way to go. Do we have any more questions? You can press star seven to unmute your line or you can type them into the chat box. All right, hearing and seeing none, I think we can wrap things up for the day. Thank you again to Dr. Roberts for doing this presentation for us today. It was very informative, very interesting. Thank you very much for doing this. Um, like I said before, we'll be sending out a post-webinar email with an evaluation and some resources. And also um, soon you will see a link to the recording on the City Match YouTube channel. So thank you all for attending and thanks again to Dr. Roberts for presenting today. Thanks everybody. Thank you.